All right, I'm going to talk to you today about the MGTOW movement. What's that? What about the MGTOW? Men going their own way, if you haven't heard about this. It's a contemporary movement. I have no idea when it started, but it's this whole thing of men just simply saying they're not sodomites or whatever else. They just are saying, I don't really want anything to do with marriage. I'm not going to date. I don't want anything to do with women. No fornication, no sodomy, just no thank you. Um, and I want to talk about this. Now, this is the extreme here. Okay, this, this is the extreme. This isn't just a man saying, you know, I just want to be single unless the Lord provides or a wife for me or whatever. No, this is the extreme, and I realize that. And that there are some viewers out there that are saying, well, I'm not into this movement. I just am a single guy. It, I get that. I get that. Okay, but I'm going to show why this is wrong from the scriptures. And uh, before you get all up antsy and, and upset and everything else, let me just say I was 36 year old, years old before I got married for the first time. And I was very much of this mindset uh, for a while. <clears throat> and I'll explain why and things as time goes by in the study. But, uh, you know, I want to show the extreme side here, but then show you why this thing, what is the purpose of marriage? Why should a man stay single? We're going to get into all that stuff today in this study. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, but as I said, just a little background on myself here. Uh, I would have—I I never even heard of this thing until years after I'd gotten married and, and whatever else. But uh, you know, I was very much into this whole thing. And I remember there was a Marty Robbins song, old country singer, and, and it was "I've got no use for the women. A true one can never be found, or can seldom be found. They'll use a man for his money. When it's gone, they'll turn him down." They're all alike at the bottom, selfish and grasping for all. They stay by a man when he's winning and laugh in his face when he falls. You know, and, and you, you have bad experiences with some women and you just say, oh, they're all that way. <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to get married. Who cares? It doesn't matter. So, you know, don't anybody say, well, you're just a, a whipped married man that, that that's why you're going against the system. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I have my reasons for being against it, which I'll show you from the scriptures today. But I'm going to show you their key verse. The key verse that this type, these guys like, and I myself used to like. Back in the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is very, very telling why Solomon would have written this. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25 through 28. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And look at what he says here in verse 26. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Okay? Um... Uh, so 28, yeah, okay. And see, you say, see, right there, the Bible says you're to escape from women. There, there's not one good woman among a thousand. Um, it's a very, very dangerous thing when you try to get doctrine from the book of Ecclesiastes. The whole purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is to show here's a man that had everything materialistically wise, and this is what happened to him as a result. Here's a, a, a man that had wealth. He had women over a, you know, a, a thousand women to choose from, not a thousand one night stands, okay? A thousand women he could choose from, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And it, this whole book is about showing him after this whole thing, everything's been given to him and he's just, what's the point of it all? And you'll see that with Hollywood celebrities that never even got close to Solomon's level of success. And they're saying, what was the point of everything? I wasted my life. What a useless bunch of, you know. Hey, are you married? No, I'm not married. Women are just after my money and, and just there's no good women out there for me and whatever. Why do they feel that way? Because you see, and here's the point. A lot of men get into sin, namely uh, fornication. And they go out there and they fornicate with multiple different women. And then they say, they just get burned out from that whole thing. And they say, you know what? I, I don't even care. I don't want anything to do with women. Or uh, you say, well, I've never fornicated. How about pornography? You see, 
all these different women. You see what they look like without their clothes on and you lust after them and whatever else. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess I'll never get married. Those things are supposed to be kept within marriage. You say, well, brother, I did those things as a lost man. Now I'm saved and I don't know what to do. Okay, there are certain sins that stay with you when you get saved. God forgives you, but those sins, the, the, the effect of those sins stays with you. You sow to the flesh and you will to the flesh reap corruption. You get tattoos before you get saved, some wicked demonic looking tattoos. They don't disappear when God saves you. And you ruin your mind with pornography and with fornication. It doesn't disappear when God saves you. You've ruined your brain. You've ruined your thought life. God doesn't want you seeing a bunch of different women without their clothes on. He wants you to see your wife that way. Have purity of mind. But you didn't do that, did you? And now you take it out on women. You say, well, there's no good women out there. Well, you filthy, filthy uh, man, you filthy loser. You didn't think that way when you were out looking at them and fornicating with them and whatever else. You see, marriage is more than just that intimate relationship. We're going to get into that as we go through this study. You say, well, there's no good women. What are you doing about that? What are you doing to change it? Oh, well, I, you know, I'm just going to sit back in my lazy boy recliner as a lazy boy and my wife is just, she's got to do everything and whatever else and I don't have any responsibility in the marriage and I can't do anything to make her a better woman. You see? What happened? Well, like King Solomon, you've burned yourself out with your fornication, with your pornography. You burned out your mind. Can the Lord feel, uh, fix that? Can He heal you? Sure. Absolutely. But you're always going to deal with those scars that you put into your head. You're never going to have the pure mind. If you're a young man out there, flee from fornication. So, yeah, I'll do that. I, you know, I, I look at it pornography occasionally. That's a different type of fornication. Okay? I realize it's not flesh joining flesh. I get that. But you're seeing things that you ought not to be looking at. And it will ruin your mind. Absolutely it will. It's not some innocent little pastime or whatever else. You can end up like King Solomon, a miserable wretch. That's the whole issue here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. You say, well, well Solomon, he was, he was one of the wisest men that ever lived, and I'll, I'll take his word. I'll take his word, you know. I mean, what do you know anyways? Well, why don't we look at this other thing that Solomon wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You know there's a difference between a wife and a woman? So, huh? What? I thought wives, wives are women. Yeah, they are. But you can just go out there in public and you say, oh, there's a woman, there's a woman, there's a woman. What if she's your wife? Do you look at her differently? With more respect? More honor? There's something deeper there when you get married. You look and say, that woman there, she stands out in the crowd because she's my wife. We have a connection spiritually, mentally, physically. She means more to me than these other women out here. How does King Solomon do that? I'm walking out in public and, hi, honey. Oh, no. Hi, honey. Oh, no. Hi, honey. Hi, you know. Oh, there's a group of 30 women over there. Yeah, they're all my wives. Oh, there's uh, 40 over there. Yeah, they're, they're my wives too. And, you know, a thousand women? How in the world would he have respect for a wife? Whoso findeth a thousand wives, findeth favor of the Lord. A wife. Singular. You'll learn to respect her. You'll learn to care for her. But you'd rather just be a miserable slob and just fornicate with this one and that one and whatever else and get online and look at a bunch of women and things. You're miserable. I know you are. I've been there. And then you hide behind the thing of, oh, I, just, I think I'm just going to stay single and whatever else. Let me just spoil the surprise here, so to speak. The only reason that you should stay single as a man, a Christian man, is because your life is going to be too dangerous to bring a wife in, like the Apostle Paul. 
hey, if I get married, it's going to be a hardship on my wife. I can't expect her to travel with me all these different places and visit me in jail and maybe go to jail with me and whatever. That's why he was single. And that's why he should have been single and stayed single and whatever else. Uh, well, I'm just going to just, you know, kind of do my thing and whatever else and just kind of get on the internet and I'll just kind of go and enjoy life and whatever else, you know, because I, I just burned myself out with fornication in the past or with pornography and whatever. And I just, I'm, I'm through that. I'm going to be a, this over here. It's wrong. It's wrong. Why don't you grow up? Get the responsibilities of having a wife and have to think about how to spiritually take care of that woman and how to love her when she's not feeling good. I remember I heard some guy in the comments years ago and he said, I was ripping on makeup and everything. A woman shouldn't wear makeup. It's toxic, you know? <laughs> not just a thing of what are you doing putting this junk on your face, you know? But it's toxic. It's not even good for your health. And the guy said, he said, I couldn't stand to see my wife without makeup. It'd be disgusting. She looks good with her makeup on. I just, oh, I see, I've seen her without her makeup and it's, ugh. Oh, you dirty, disgusting, filthy wretch, you. Uh, you need to love your wife if she's sick. If she's vomiting. Whatever. If she becomes paralyzed, take care of her. See? Hmm. You want to avoid that, though, because you still kind of like that glossy image of the pornography or the, the one-night stand that you had there with that, that hot girl that you met. I don't want the responsibilities to have a wife. You got some problems. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 15 through 20. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. Did you know that fornication is just essentially a marriage? Now I realize you're not living as husband and wife and whatever else, so you can't technically say it was a marriage per se, but it's the same thing as being married in terms of joining flesh to flesh. You realize how dangerous that is? How much that messes you up? Hmm. Verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You guys out there that have fornicated multiple times with multiple girls. Do you realize you were sinning against your own body? You're scarring yourself. You guys out there that looked at pornography for years and years and years. All different types of pornography. Probably hundreds of, of different women and whatever else. You've seen them without their clothes on. What are you doing? Destroying your mind. Pornography is there to teach you to mentally undress every woman that you look at. Instead of just looking and saying, hey, that's my wife over there. What about these other women? Oh, they're women. Fine, whatever else. I'm witness to them, whatever. You gotta have a corrupt mind because of looking at that stuff. Because of committing fornication. You've ruined yourself. Admit it. I mean, you might as well just admit it. And you will struggle with that for the rest of your life. You'll never be able to say, I had a pure mind when I went into marriage. Just the way it is. I mean, you know, I, I get so sick and tired of this, this, this disgusting, sissy little preaching of, of nowadays of, well, you can, be, you can be a second time virgin and you can be pure and whatever else. You know, if you looked at pornography, God can forgive you and he can just give you a pure mind. No, he can't. Okay. <laughs> He'll forgive you. Yes. But he's not going to give you a pure mind. You will struggle. You will fight the wickedness of your sin. Have you read Romans chapter 7? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul is vexed. Oh, if you looked at pornography, God can just forgive you. If you've committed fornication, young man, in your past, God can just forgive you and just look at, well, he'll forgive you in the sense of going to heaven. But that scar is going to be there with you. From now on. Well, I don't think I should marry. 
didn't stop you from fornicating, looking at pornography. Why don't you get married to a woman and actually try to do right? Be a real man. Take care of your wife. Have a son. If the Lord gives you a son and teach your son, don't you ever look at pornography. Don't you ever go out there and fornicate. Too much responsibility, huh? Verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's what you're supposed to do, but how can you do that when you've had all these sins in your past? Hmm. Well, he's forgiven me. I'm sure he has. That's good. It's good the Lord's forgiven me too. But that stuff is still up there. The scars are still there. I have a lot of scars on my body from my lost life. They didn't go away when I got saved. And I'll struggle with that stuff for the rest of my life. But you see, getting married forces me to take more responsibility. I don't live selfishly. There's charity in marriage. There's times my wife needs to talk to me about something. There's times my wife needs help with things. I can't just say, oh, what, you know, come on. You know, I, I'm just living my, you know, I'm going my own way, woman. <laughs> what a miserable existence. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let's continue reading here. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Speaking of fornication, how do you know? Keep reading. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication... Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, stop there, we'll get back to the passage here but let me just explain something to you um when you fornicate how do you feel afterwards do you feel that you've done right no no you don't when you look at pornography do you feel good afterwards no and you can be the most hardcore atheist and whatever else i don't care who you are and how wicked you are if you fornicate and you look at pornography you will never come away feeling good about it and feeling a long-lasting peace and joy and happiness. You'll never feel it, ever, for any reason. But you know what happens when you get married? When you, as a man, take on spiritual headship over your wife and you come together in the marriage bed, you feel good afterwards. There's no guilt. There's no, oh man, I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I'd... You feel good. Why? It's what God designed. That's what it's talking about there. Verse 6, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. He's a single man. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. One after this manner being single, another after that being married. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. All right, you say, well, you know what, okay, but couldn't I just go out and fornicate and, and then I can get rid of the burning and things? Fornication never gets rid of the burning. Pornography never gets rid of the burning. Well, so, well it, it does, takes it temporarily away, yeah, and then you go back to it. You see? God's system, you can't get away from it. You just, you can't. If you have lust issues, Get married. The marriage bed is there to take care of that, but then you get all the other responsibilities of marriage, which a lot of lazy men don't want. That's the whole thing. Oh, there's going to be another mouth to feed there. i got to take care of my wife. Oh, and uh, she shouldn't be working outside the home. Put that one on. You mean I'm going to have to provide for her? Uh-huh, yeah. When she needs a new dress, you got to get it for her. 
when she needs food to make and things and whatever else, you're the one that has to provide it. Well, I don't know if I want that. I have the lust, but I don't know if I want to take care of the other thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, the vast majority of my life, I was a single man. And I will tell you right now from personal experience, there's a lot about the Lord that you can't learn until you get married. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the, the husband and the wife and their relationship, and it's, and it's similar to Christ and the church. All of a sudden, you start to see the thing of taking care of the weaker vessel, and you start to see what Jesus Christ has to put up with with his church. But Jesus Christ is perfect, and you're not as a man. And you have to see, you know what? I'm supposed to, to, to rule over my wife as Christ does to the church. I'm supposed to care for her. And all of a sudden, you start to grow up. And then all of a sudden, the Lord gives you a child. If you want a real good experience, deliver the child yourself. Like the Lord helped me to do. That's a good one. That'll, uh, that'll mature you very quickly. Okay? You get to see all the blood and the birthing fluid and everything else there and stuff. And it's all over you and whatever. And, and, and everything. And she's there. And you're thinking, okay, make sure you're going through all the stuff you've learned and, and studied and whatever else. How to deliver a baby. That, that'll make you a man real quick. And that's what men did for thousands of years. All of a sudden, oh, you know, we have birth centers. Just, you know, oh, you, oh, oh you, you're, you're going into labor? Okay, get in the car. You know, okay, what do I need to do? Put your bag in there of your stuff and whatever else. And I'll drive you to the car or to the hospital, honey. And you get there and they bring out the wheelchair and they stick her in that. And then they do everything for you. And you can just go down to the cafeteria and have a coffee and a donut while she's up there giving birth. Wow, you stud you. Oh, it's such a, such a dangerous thing to deliver a baby. No, it's not. No, it's not. Learn how to do it. Men have done it for thousands of years. Grow up. Get irritated with people. <laughs> but if you want to be single, okay, then follow the life of Paul. You're going to go out there and you're going to live some daring, bold life for the Lord and whatever else. Okay. Uh, I remember, I think it was David Brainerd. Uh, was going to be a missionary to the Native Americans here in America back in the 1700s, I think it was. Forgive me if I have it wrong, but I, I think it was David Brainerd. And uh, he was betrothed to this young woman and very much in love with her. And he just got under conviction about going out and preaching to the Indians. And he said, he came to her and he said, I'm sorry, I can't marry you. I, I, I have to break up our marriage and, and everything. You know, that's our, our coming marriage, not that they were married, but... And he said, it's just going to be too much to ask of you to go out into the wilderness with me. The hardships are going to be too great. And they were. He died a young man. He uh, got sick quite a bit and whatever else. Um, really went through some hard times. And yeah, they split up. He called off the marriage. He stayed single because he was going to serve the Lord. Okay, you study the life of Robert Sheffy. Um, the guy should have stayed single. Okay, he made a lot of hardship on his wife and his children. Um, killed the first one, basically, because of that. Uh, she died because he wasn't there for her. Well, that's wrong. Okay, if you're going to do that, if you're going to really serve the Lord hardcore and you're just going to be out there all the time preaching the Word and whatever, stay single, Okay, like Paul did. All right, But uh, you're just going to be at home just watching Internet stuff and just playing video games and like I used to do and, you know, and uh, you're just going to do your own thing. Um, no, no. And occasionally you just kind of dabble in pornography, just occasionally. And you just, you know, maybe a little fornicative relationship. You know, just, but, you know, I, I just don't want the thing of marriage. I just, I, I'm going to go my own way, you see. I, I just don't think, I, it, you're in serious sin. Very serious sin. And in fact, a doctrine of devils. We'll end with that. But let's look at a couple other things here. Genesis chapter 2. And you see, there's, there's some things I don't really have a whole lot of right to preach on, you know, and, and really get rough and whatever else, because I haven't really struggled with that stuff. Um, whatever. But this one, I'm going to rip your hide off and nail it to the wall. Because by attacking you, I can say, hey, I went through this stuff. See, I've, remo I've removed the, uh, the, you know, beam out of my own eye, so now I can judge you. I know what you're thinking out there, men. That I don't, I don't know if I want to get married. I don't know, whatever. 
I'm just going to stay single. Yeah. I know your motivation for it. I went through it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Oh, no, it, it is. I enjoy my single life. I enjoy it. I can do my own thing. I come and go as I please. I don't have anybody to take care. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Well, there aren't any good help meets in my area. I don't have a, There's no good women around. I can't find a good woman among a thousand. Yeah, because you fornicated with a bunch of them that might have actually been a good wife. Had you stuck with her and respected her enough to wait until you were married to get into the marriage bed. Or maybe uh, if you had met a woman and not had preconceived ideas in your mind about what her body should look like because of all the hours and hours and hours of pornography that you've looked at. You know what I mean? Verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. By the way, you can't say duck it by saying, I oh, just me and my dog, we just live here in my cabin and we... The Lord formed those different beasts, and he said, None of these are a helpmate for man. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There you see it again. The marriage bed, undefiled. The Bible, book, book of Hebrews talks about that. But the marriage bed, there's nothing wrong with it. They're not ashamed. A husband and a wife coming together, there's no shame there when they're naked. None. You don't have to feel that guilty just like you're some low-down dirty dog because of fornicating or because of pornography or whatever else. You don't have to feel that. Marriage is a beautiful thing. It really is. I look back at my life as a single man and I realize I, I probably wouldn't even be alive today had the Lord not brought my wife into my life. Selfish, center, you know, self-centered, uh, this whole thing right here. Hmm. Absolutely terrible. But let's look at the infamous thing here. Proverbs 31. If I could only find a Proverbs 31 woman, brother, you know, there's just not many good women out there. If I could just find a Proverbs 31 woman, you know, she's got to be the one that, that uh, you know, does everything. And, and I mean, there's just, I, I haven't found the right woman yet. Proverbs 31, verse 10, we'll begin there. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Say, so, see, she has to be perfect before I find her. She's got to be just that right woman and whatever else. I don't have any part in it. Let's continue. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Good quality there. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Also very good. You say, well, see, this is a, this is a good woman. You've got to find this good woman or else don't even get married. But now we're going to start to see your responsibility as a man. There's a lot of good women out there, but they need the help of a man to make them even better. Let's look about that. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Um, where is the wool and flax coming from? Her husband provides it for her. Comes home, hey, um, would you like a loom? Way to start making weaving your own cloth and whatever else you want. To, you want a spinning wheel. You want to. You want this. You want. You want to be able to learn how to sew. You want some crochet hooks and some knitting needles and. And you need the material for it. I'll, I'll buy that for you. Provide for his wife. You know. Verse fourteen. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Who provides the money for that food? That'd be the uh, working man. 
She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth me to her household and a portion to her maidens. Who built the house for her? Hmm. You want to be a real man? Try building a house for your wife. That'll teach you a few things. Um, struggling in life and, and, and finding things difficult and whatever else, it makes a man out of you. Builds character. One of my funny little jokes I like to say, but there's a lot of truth behind what I'm saying there. You need to have some character built into your life. And marriage will do it to you. Verse 16, she considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Who gave her the money? Who provided for her? That'd be the man. I preached a sermon many, many years ago, an old audio sermon called the Proverbs 31 Man. A lot of guys that think about the Proverbs 31 woman don't realize that she's not possible without a man. Hmm. Verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. Do you support a woman that wants to work like that? Do you tell her, do you praise her, do you say, hey, honey, you did a great job. Wow, that is beautiful. Man, there's some talented young women out there. Oh, but they're not perfect. They're not the, the, the glossy photoshopped, you know, bimbo that I used to look at with pornography and whatever else. You see how it messes your head up? She's not a, she's not a, a cover girl. She's not a, a supermodel, a stupor model. Um, I don't know if I could marry her. You're wicked is what you are. Look for a woman that loves the Lord and say, hey, you know what? I'd like to make her into the Proverbs 31 woman. I want to do my part. I want to work hard to provide for that woman so she can be all the Lord intends her to be. I'm just going to hide at home and just pretend that I'm a MGTOW. Uh -huh. Verse 19, She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Funny that the Vatican tries to you know, imitate the Proverbs 31 woman with the whore. They're purple and scarlet, Revelation 17. find that interesting. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Huh? No, no, no. See, the Proverbs 31 woman, I'm looking for her. Uh, a single woman out there, that, that she's a Proverbs 31 woman. Um, when I find her, I'll, I might marry her. Maybe. You know, if she's exactly what I'm looking for. The Proverbs 31 woman doesn't exist without a Proverbs 31 man. And he's known in the gates because he's a hard worker. He's a real man that stands up for things and says and stands against things and says, no, nah, no, we're not doing that. Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's making rulings and judgments for his home. Verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. You say, wait a second. Then she's a career woman. She's not a career woman. She's not working outside the home. Maketh fine linen and selleth it. She's doing that in her house. There's nothing wrong with a woman having an income when she's working at home. The danger is when she leaves the home and she's away from the protection of her husband. Kind of like what happened in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Where was Adam at? He was out there by herself and starts talking to a man. A serpent named Lucifer. And look what happened. Hmm. You got to wonder if Adam had some other things to do that day. And she said, hey, Adam, do you want to go for a walk in the garden? I, you know, I'd like to go. Uh, yeah, um, just, you know, whatever. I, I, I got this thing to do here. I have to go my own way today, honey. <laughs> you know, not saying he was trying to forcibly be a sin, single guy or whatever, but you know what I'm saying here. And yet, Men still do the same thing today. Honey, we got bills to pay. We got to have two incomes. I mean, you can get a job down at the bank. You can get a job over here at the grocery store. You can get a job at the... Da, 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 da. And all of a sudden, she's coming home and, and uh, she's acting a little different. Well, I don't know. She just don't want to talk about her day at work and whatever. And all of a sudden, she doesn't come home some evening. She doesn't come home that night. 
things start to fall apart. And then you hear a story and some guy says, hey, I saw your wife out running around with so-and-so where she works. What? Oh, that dirty, rotten woman. No, that dirty, rotten man that sent his wife out to work. You know, there's a lot that's blamed on women. And when you get to the root of it, it's actually the man that's at fault. The man should have never said, go to work. You know why God blamed Adam for what happened to Eve? Because Adam should have been there to protect her and should have said to her, don't you talk to any other man. That Lucifer guy, don't you talk to him. But Adam was probably too busy, had his own thing going and whatever else. I know the Bible doesn't say, I get that. But why wasn't he there? Why did she feel free talking to this guy? Set the stage for how marriages have been ruined ever since then. Hmm. Verse 25, Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. What's it say in 1 Corinthians 14? If a woman has a question, she's to ask her husband at home. Where does a woman, woman's wisdom come from? She should have a wise husband. Why don't you want to fulfill that role? Single guy, loving your single life, doing your thing. Why don't you want to fulfill that role for a woman? Impart the wisdom that God has given to you. Impart it to a wife. Think your way through those times when she is saying some things that you know aren't in the Bible and you say, wait a second here, this is, you know, I have an option here. I can yell and scream at her and say, this won't happen in my house. Or I can think my way through this and pray my way through this and say, okay, Lord, how do I handle this as a spiritual head in this home? How do I handle this in a way giving honor unto the weaker vessel instead of acting like a prideful jerk to her? Takes a man to do that, you know? You know? Imparting that wisdom, having that patience there, not letting your pride get the best of you. I just, I'll just avoid it. I'll just avoid it. Because, you know, I've, I've had my fill of, of the women thing, and I'm just going to go my own way now. Continuing here. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Do you make a way for your wife to be idle? I sure hope not. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Well, I got to find that right woman or else I'm just not going to get married. Praise her. You're the one that can build that woman up or tear her down. You see, you see how the, the Bible just jabs you and jabs you and jabs you and pokes you? It did to me as a single man, and it does to me as a married man. And there's been times I've yelled at my wife and done stupid things and whatever else in my pride, and the Lord just smashes me over the head with His Word. What are you doing, you prideful little jerk? <laughs> sorry, Lord. Yeah, well, tell her you're sorry now. And act like a man. Admit your faults and move forward. That's why it's not good for a man to be alone. Okay, if you're going to burn out, if you're going to go out and you're going to serve the Lord and, and do like the Apostle Paul did, you're going to be in and out of prison and you're going to be whatever. Okay, stay single. Don't put a woman through that. But if you're just single and doing your own little thing and whatever else and you don't want to take care of a wife, God be merciful to you. Verse 29, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. By who? What did it say in verse 28? Her husband also, and he praiseth her. A woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. She needs a husband there. Why don't you look for a, a Christian woman that's born again, that's saved, and say, I'm going to help her. With God's help, I'm going to make that woman great. I'm going to make that woman into the Proverbs 31 woman. 
Lord, help me to be the best husband that I can be. Help me to make that woman truly great in your sight. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. You know, a lot of the research that goes into this ministry comes from my wife. Sitting over that way right now. There were a lot of studies that I had that I just thought, I just, Lord, I just can't get through this. I can't think of how, what, do, where would I find this or where would I find that and whatever else. And, and uh, just a lot of them I just said, okay, I, you're just not giving me this study, Lord. I'll just have to put it on the shelf. People want to hear this and, you know, whatever else. I just can't do it. The Lord brought me my wife and, and with her very, very unique background. And I'd bring up these subjects. We talk about the Bible every day. Uh, there's no such thing as a day when we don't talk about the Bible. Um, and she starts to help me with the research. And the Lord shows her things. It just boggles my mind. I couldn't find if my life depended on it. Whoso findeth the wife findeth a good thing. Oh, no, no, I find more bitter than death the woman. Okay? Written by a man who'd fornicated. Well, I shouldn't say fornicated because technically he was allowed to be married to those women. But uh, a man that had no respect for women because he had a thousand of them. He didn't have a wife. And yet the Lord inspires him to write Proverbs 31. Hmm. Very interesting. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Key verse of Scripture in your New Testament. And a very, very big challenge to a man. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now I've been accused many times by some of these wicked devils out there of uh, Brian Denlinger does not uh, provide for his own. He does not provide for his wife. They live out in the middle of nowhere and they're very poor and whatever else. Um, hate to tell you, honey, but uh, uh, providing for your wife does not mean becoming a indebted slave to some big mortgage and some humongous big house that we can barely afford to heat and vehicles that we can barely afford to drive and, and we're drowning in, in debt and whatever else. But we, we got the image thing going. That's not providing. Okay? And if that's your idea of providing, I can tell you, you're the one that's denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. Um, providing for a wife, by the way, too, is not just monetary. There's a whole lot that goes along with providing for a wife. And those things will make you stronger as a man. Listening to her feelings. Listening to her thoughts. Um, providing for her when she's sick. Taking care of her. You going to change the baby or is that just the woman's work? You're going to make a meal once in a while, wash the dishes when she's too sick to do it. Hey, um, I had some things I needed to get done today, but uh, she'd want, she wants to go for a walk. Hey, I, I, I have to, I have to get to work hunting here. I, I got to get this stuff done and whatever else, but we needed to do something special. We haven't done anything in a while. Take her on a little day vacation or whatever else. I'm not saying you got to go to Paris and buy her diamond jewelry or something like that. No, no. I mean, you find the right kind of woman, you won't have to do that stuff. You're finding the wrong kind, well, you know, because you're letting your your lust decide instead of the Holy Spirit decide what your you know who your wife is going to be. You know, discuss those things by the way too before you get married. If a woman's all in materialistic and whatever else, well, move on to the next one. Okay, I'm not saying fornicate with her either. I'm saying talking. But uh, providing for your own is a very important thing. And it teaches you things spiritually. I mean, look at that. Uh, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What, what you, huh? Well, well, Paul, why would you write that? Denied the faith? You're writing that about a married man, and yet you're single? Well, then I guess you've really denied the faith. No. That's not, not, not talking about that. It's talking about over in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. I'll show you this real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 22. We'll start there. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Very true. That's for the, wo the woman. 
Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Sacrifice. That's providing for your own. Sacrificing your interests. How's this working out? I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to keep my own money. I don't want to have to provide for a woman. I don't want to have to think about her emotions and her needs and whatever. And I'm, But I'm not going to go serve the Lord radically and you know, whatever else either. I'm just going to kind of do my own thing. <laughs> Brother, if you're doing that, you're wrong. You are wrong. You're out of fellowship with the Lord. I'll tell you that right now. You start praying fervently. I'm not just saying you go out the first woman you see and she's somewhat attractive and I think she might be saved. You, hey, marry me. I'm going to make you a great woman. No. Pray about it. Take some time. Get to know a woman first and whatever else. But marriages, they don't just break up because the woman was rotten. Okay? I see that one a lot, you know, too. All this woman, that you know, she was just this and she was that. And I, you know, tried everything and whatever. Uh, most marriages I've seen, um, when you get to talking to the guy and the woman was rotten and she was this and she was that, there was a lot of stuff that the man was doing that he shouldn't have been doing, putting her into careerism and whatever else, and that's what made the marriage fall apart. It wasn't all just the rotten woman and whatever else. Well, well there's times, brother, though, that you don't understand. There's times that women are rotten and think... Yeah, I've heard the excuses. But let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter, well, let's read, continue reading in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Then he, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Preach the Bible to her. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. What did the Bible say about fornication? If you commit fornication with a harlot, you're sinning against your own body. Here it's saying you're actually loving your own body when you're with your wife. You see the difference there? So don't say, I don't want marriage because I've had bad experiences with women in the past and fornication. That stuff destroyed my body. The pornography destroyed my mind. So I don't want anything to do with it anymore. I'm just going to do, do this here. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. It's a great help to you as a man to be able to get married. But let's end up here with 1 Timothy chapter 4. And here's the big one. This is the one that will get you. I've got no use for the women. A true one can seldom be found. Okay, well, what about this? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And it goes on to talk about that. Every creature of God is good. Okay. But forbidding to marry is what? Doctrine of devils. I'm just going to go my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, then you're falling for a doctrine of devils. If you lived a very, very wicked, evil life in the past, fornication, pornography, then I would say either you get real radical for the Lord and get thrown in prison for what you're doing, or I would say get married. Start to look for a woman that you can help. Marriage isn't just all about you there, brother. Um, marriage is about the woman too. And there are a lot of women out there that need a godly husband. Oh, you know, I'm just going to be friends with, you know, sister so-and-so and whatever else. We'll all just be celibate people. Yeah, how's that work for Catholicism? Well, we'll have celibacy within the Bible-believing community. Because it works so good in Catholicism. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Be a man. Get a wife. It's not good that the man should be alone. God can make a helpmeet for you. And she needs you just as bad as you need her. Okay? 
See, that was a pretty rough sermon. Yeah, it was. And I wish somebody would have preached it to me years ago. So the effeminate little sissies in the church buildings that I'd go to and they'd, well, you know, what, everybody has their own little gift and, you know, whatever. And we'll have singles club and, and things and, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, it is a serious matter. It really is. And I think a lot of men out there are falling for this movement. Um, and they're just looking at women out there in the world and they're saying, oh, they're terrible, they're wicked. Um, you don't know the heart condition of those women either, by the way. And if you're a man enough to go up and, and witness to some woman and whatever, a lot of these women, they're out there searching. They don't know what to believe. They don't know where to go. Their fathers kicked them out of the home, pushed them out into careerism, pushed them into the college world. They have, I don't know what to believe. I, I, I'm afraid to go to these churches. There's men there that are after me. I go to college and men there are after me. At my job, the men are after me there. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to believe. And you as a Christian man, you can come and you can bring sanity into that woman's life. And you go and you try to talk to her and you realize, oh, okay, she's into that stuff, into that world. Okay, you need to get saved, okay? You're wicked, whatever. You go on to the next one. And you meet the, that girl, that woman, and, and she says, I don't know about a lot of this stuff, about the Bible and whatever, but I'd like to hear more about this. She needs help. She needs a spiritual covering. And you take her back to her parents and you say, you know what? Um, I want to marry your daughter. Well, I don't know if we're for her marrying a fanatic like you and whatever else and stuff. And, well, whatever. I want to marry her. And, you know, the Lord so inspires you, just say, you're not, you're not a good spiritual covering for her. You pushed her out into the, into the wicked world out there. And by the way, if you're a father and you have a teenage daughter, don't you dare send her to college. How dare you send her out to a place where young people are turned into atheists all the time? Well, I'm going to send her to a good Bible college. And she's away from your protection? Oh, well, the professors there will protect her and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, right. There's fornication at those places. There's all kinds of wicked stuff. How many young women went off to Hiles Anderson College and now are atheists? Now hate the Lord. They despise the Lord. Make them do all the little standards and you can't do this and you can't do that and whatever else. And they come out wicked. If you have a daughter, you watch over her like a hawk. I don't mean control her life to the point where she's just, you know, everywhere she goes, you're following her with binoculars, you know. Don't put her in harm's way, though. And pray about the Lord sending a young man into her life. But keep her in your home until that time happens. That's very important. Okay? Uh, you know, I, I realize I'm talking to a very, very backward world out there. And there's so many of us that have been just so defiled and just done so many stupid things and whatever else. But you know what? You have to take responsibility for your actions. And you have to say, all right, Lord, I've destroyed my mind. I'm sorry. And I can't ever get my mind back. That purity of mind that I had as a child, that's gone. I started uh, looking at pornography. My older brother would bring magazines from a, a neighborhood boy, and he'd bring me in, and uh, these magazines, and, hey, come here, you know, and he'd go into his room, and he'd say, check it out, you know. And at first I'm looking and thinking, I don't even know what this is. I mean, I was really, really young, and that was back in the 1980s. <laughs> now it's Internet and whatever else. I mean, it's just so much worse. And I mean, it, it, just terrible. Um, and again, if you're if you're a parent, you know, guard your sons from this stuff. I mean, good night. <laughs> Don't let them have internet access in, in, in their bedrooms and whatever else. I mean, use your brain here. Don't let them go pal around with lost children. Think. <laughs> you have to guard them. Well, you know, I, I, I provide for them, you know, with money and whatever else. Do you provide safety? Do you provide strong spiritual headship? Well, we go to church. Yeah, how's that work out? I knew young guys that were they were looking at you know pornography type stuff in church groups and whatever else. There was a, a sodomite orgy at the church I grew up at, and but because it was the key families, they covered it up. Didn't even know about it till many years later. Yeah, <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that are just messed up in this world, and what I'm saying to you out there. If you've committed fornication, if you've looked at pornography, the best thing for you is to take this thing and say, not happening. 
I don't want to go my own way. Lord, if there's some young lady out there that loves you or that even doesn't even know you and is just looking for truth and she wants somebody to be there to protect her, provide for her, she would like to be the Proverbs 31 woman. She doesn't understand it all yet. Lord, send me. Help me to be that guy that comes into her life, that turns her life around. Lord, make me the kind of husband that I should be. Um, Lord, help me not to be self-centered in marriage. Help me not to be prideful. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you say, brother, I just don't, I don't, there's no woman in my life and I don't really feel any kind of desire in that way and whatever. Okay, then just get real bold for the Lord. Just get out there and start doing things for the Lord that uh, are against the law. Okay, I don't mean wicked things, you know, thievery or murder or something. I'm talking about just get out there and just put your neck on the line and walk out in front of some Jesuit university and start telling the truth about the Jesuits through a loudspeaker. Say, so they're going to, well, they'd arrest me. What do you care? You're single. You don't have a wife and children to think about. But uh, no, brother, I'm just going to be the single guy that just sits at home, plays video games in my parents' house, and I don't want the responsibilities of a wife. You're wasting your life. And you're never going to get real close to the Lord. Simple. I'm a veteran of that movement. So, take it or leave it. Just as simple as that. But if you're falling for that movement... You're not right with God. That's all there is to it. That's going to be it. I do hope that this has been a challenge to you. And I hope that you search the scriptures and to see if these things are so. Uh, if the Lord is really convicting you right now, sort of the Spirit is stabbing you in the heart right now and saying, you're falling for this stuff. You're wicked. Then change. Don't change because I told you to do it. Change because the Holy Spirit's convicting you. That's going to be it. We'll see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.